Noticed, I looked today um, on the UFO Reporting Center, and they have listed uh, several sightings that were in Kansas this month. There were like four of them. Let me bring it up here. This again is the uh, National UFO Reporting Center. It's a private organization. Of course, the government doesn't do anything anymore. But uh, what they've, I'm still waiting for my phone number. But uh, what, what they basically do is they, they, they have a form that people can fill out online and give the details. And we have other organizations that are in um, Kansas. One of them is uh, MUFON of Kansas. It stands for the Mutual UFO Network. And what they do is, if people want to report anything, they have some uh, trained investigators who go out and they do interviews and they, they go to the sites and they, they check out photos. Uh, like you said, there are lots of videos, but then again, there's also a program called Photoshop <laughs> that people can make things up. And before Photoshop, people were actually doing things like throwing hats up into the air, uh, throwing uh, hubcaps up into the air. So, uh, so a lot of those sightings that people, a lot of the, the um, photographs that people turned in uh, were somewhat questionable, although we don't see a lot of photographs in uh, Project Blue Book. We do see some, but um, either they did not put them in there or they turned them over to another agency, which continued the investigation. That's sort of my guess. Yes. You would, you would think some of the quote unquote sightings that occur in in the areas where there are lots of people like Kansas City or Wyandotte, that there would be lots of people seeing these and yet the reports seem to always come from one person or a couple of people. That's kind of mystifying to me. Well, <laughs> I've noticed that too, and I think what happens is not everybody's looking up at the same time. Um, also, if, if more than one person sees it, some people are just not, you know, they just are a little bit afraid of reporting anything. I used to get phone calls into the newspaper, and any of you who ever worked in a newspaper office, I know at least one person in the room who has. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people won't identify themselves, but they'll say, I saw some lights over the sky last night. Did anybody else report anything? You know, they're just curious as to what it was. And, you know, can you tell us about what you saw? Well, you know, it was a greenish object. You know, it was flying over the trees. But can you give me your name? And then they hang up. <laughs> at, this, at this point in your personal journey, where do you stand? Do you believe there, do you believe these are, do you think there are UFOs? <laughs> I, I am less skeptical than I was when I first started. I thought I was just going to have a lot of fun and, and read, a, read a lot of it. Suddenly I, I start reading about this stuff and I begin to get worried. And I see that um, it doesn't make any sense why they would have dropped these investigations. It seems obvious that somebody, if they were really that concerned about protecting uh, our airspace over the contiguous 48 states, that they would have sent pilots up in an aircraft to chase some of these things down. Um, but they just kind of let them go. So either they knew what they were. They were something they may have been our own secret projects or or they decided it was all hooey and just give up. Well that's what they said. That was their statement that uh, uh, early on when uh, Project Sign began uh, back in 1947 uh, it went for two years and uh, a lot of them actually wanted the said that there was something to these Sightings, but they turned it over to General Vandenberg, and Vandenberg didn't want to have anything to do with flying saucers. He said, "No, we're not going to consider any of these as being extraterrestrial, because then the public would not feel like they were safe. We want to make sure that you know our skies are our skies are safe, and the United States Air Force can protect us." Yes. Yeah. I I just think it's, you can't ignore when, when Air Force pilots who are trained to recognize aircraft and estimate speeds 
say they see something that went, was going 2,000 miles an hour that was not anything recognizable. I, that's pretty compelling. And I mean, even from the first sighting, the military guy that, that I guess made the mistake of saying he saw something, the wreckage, which was nothing the U.S. was doing or had, you know, it was completely unfamiliar. Then a day later, retraction, weather balloon. Yeah, you're, you're I'm talking about the Roswell crash. Right. How can you, you know, there's something there, like you said. Well, as in the Roswell crash, I think the idea was to get the public to look the other way. Um, I, found, I found out since, after doing that research, I've actually been out to Roswell twice. Um, and I had a tour the other day, or back about two months ago. Um, the people out there actually think that there was something to it. Um, they were told to keep quiet, to keep quiet about it right after it happened. And of course, you know, the United States had just freshly come off uh, World War II, and everybody was, you know, playing along and, and not talking, and security was a big issue. And you were told not to say anything about anything you knew. So people kept a lid on it, and they. They, you know, felt it was a sense of honor that they didn't say anything. Uh, and a, lot of, a lot of people took it to their grave. They were told by the generals, don't say anything. And, but then a lot of people on their deathbeds have come forward and said, the word needs to get out. We thought it was going to be out by now. We thought that maybe we would keep quiet and somebody would eventually say something. But somebody's got to come forward and tell what we actually did see. So then you start getting a lot of these videos on YouTube of uh, people who are maybe in their 80s and 90s who were young adults at that time who were coming out and wanting to tell somebody what they saw. Of course, they have no proof. All they have is their word and, you know, somebody you do. Yes? There are many cases in which there's evidence on the ground. You mentioned matted grass, but like more than that, like a hole in the ground or trees knocked down? Uh, in that particular case, all they could find was uh, grass that had been matted down. They, um, they didn't find anything like uh, pieces of wreckage or anything. You see, Kansas, we're just, you know, I just looked at about maybe a dozen or 20 or so cases in Kansas. There are 701 cases spread throughout the United States that they, they claim were unknown. And then there are probably other ones that weren't even recorded that may be shot off to some other agency like the NSA. They may have looked been, you know, not even, didn't even go through Project Blue Book. So the more I look into it, the, you know, the crazier it seems to get. Is there any significance to 1947? I mean, what, what did there has to, I mean, why, why does this all start then? Is there any pre-1947 um, stuff about UFOs? Well, they, yeah, if you ever watch the ancient alien shows on TV, they claim that we've had, that we've had visits from uh, people from other planets from, you know, back throughout the centuries. Uh, but in the United States, the main uh, flying saucers got came into the public uh, view in 1947 with Kenneth Arnold, who was a pilot up in, up in Washington, first saw about nine objects as he was flying along. Um, he went and reported it. They were flying around 2,000 miles an hour. He said they were like no other aircraft he'd ever seen. Um, the reporters got a hold of it, and they dubbed them. He said they were skipping across um, the, uh, the mountains like uh, like saucers on a pond. Well, the reporters got a hold of it and started calling them flying saucers. Next thing you know, everybody's calling them flying discs or flying saucers. And that same that's the same time, but about two months later, that the uh, alleged Roswell crash happened. Now we don't really know what the aliens supposedly were doing, <laughs> if they were here, what they were doing. Um, Maybe they were coming in to just visit our planet. Uh, maybe they met with uh, Eisenhower. <laughs> <laughs>
there are there are uh, you know stories out there that Eisenhower had a piece of missing time when he was out in California. He supposedly went out there for a vacation and to play golf, and then suddenly he's gone for about 12 hours, and uh, nobody knew where he was. The press couldn't was was told that he was spirited off to a dentist appointment. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. In, in response to that Y-47, I, I read or saw it in the documentary, I thought it was a pretty good supposition that um, once, once this planet became nuclear, that was somehow detectable from long distances and that's why it attracted, maybe they've been around forever, but the idea was that that's why they, the planet suddenly, there's a rash of sightings because yeah, we reached a certain level of technology where they want to check us out. Are we a threat? Can, you know, can we be can we be used for their nefarious schemes, or whatever? Yeah, now you're starting to get into conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I I've been trying to limit myself to documentation. You know, just going through these things and finding out what's actually out there and been reported. And uh, but yeah, I've I've heard those things. And those are really interesting. Sometimes you, it, it, the conspiracy kind of links things together that really aren't linked, but and again, yes? Has the Civil Air Patrol gotten involved in any of this? I think the Civil Air Patrol <coughs> was uh, asked to, to report UFO sightings when they first started out. I'm not, I, like I said, I haven't really done so much research that I can say for sure what role they play, but I do, I do know that, that uh, the Air Force in 1947 was given the lead on the project. Um, if you know your military history, uh, in 1947 the Army split off the Air Force into a separate uh, division. Uh, before that, it was part of the Army, but uh, uh, General May wanted it to be a separate. Uh, organization. So, and their first big thing that they did was because flying saucers were hot at that time, uh, they decided to turn over the investigation over to the Air Force. So the sightings started getting noticed the year the Air Force was formed. Right. Interesting. Well, I mean, there were there were sightings before that. There were the ghost rockets in, in World War II. And they were the, the Foo Fighters in World War II that people have probably heard about. But there was no really formal investigation until 1947, until they started being seen over the mainland United States. Are any other countries uh, involved in this? Just about every country, I think, has had some kind of sighting. Uh, the reason that the United States has always uh, carried the lead on it was because after World War II, we were the military power in the world. We had Air Force bases all over the world. And so a lot of the sightings were from, you know, the South Pacific and the Arctic and where we had a military base. But uh, yes, uh, Great Britain was involved. Um, the Soviet Union, I think when they dissolved, they, it was learning that they had their own program to go out and investigate. So, uh, yeah, there's still a lot we don't know. Still a lot I haven't personally looked at, but I, it seems like every day I find out something new. And I'm trying to sift through the conspiracy and find the actuality. Anybody else? Phil? Do you have a favorite, favorite like, blue book case? Well, my favorite is, well, I have the, the two favorites. The, the radio announcer down in Pittsburgh, he seemed very sincere. Uh, he, I don't know, some of you are older than me and probably remember the Art Bell program yes. on radio. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Art Bell had him on, and he described what he saw. Um, and the other one that uh, I liked was the Kansas City one because my daughter lives over in that area, and I can kind of relate to it. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm right now, I'm, I'm uh, writing a book 
on uh, going through these uh, cold cases that happen in Missouri. Um, yes. If you if you begin with uh, the assumption that UFOs are just they, they don't exist, it's it's baloney. Then the question becomes, what's going on with all these people? <laughs> like, what's happening to these pilots? Are they having is it some kind of biological, physiological, ocular thing? Is it what? It, I mean, what's going on? Well, Project Blue Book's um, first director, a um, man by the name of uh, last name Ruppelt, R-U-P-P-E-L-T. Um, he wrote several books after he got out of it, uh, being the director. And one of his things was he said he thought maybe a lot of people were seeing UFOs because other people were seeing UFOs. Kind of came to, because he could never really, in his position, he was more like the, the head of the public relations division of Project Blood Book. Um, and everything that he knew, he couldn't actually figure out why there were so many sightings in certain years. Like we had a big, big uh, group of them in 1947, another one in, I think, 1952, another one about five years later. And there, it seems like maybe we have five year cycles. Don't know if they were visiting in five-year increments. You know, again, that's kind of like. Yes. Well, I, I have been a physics professor at KU for many years, and, and in one an honors course, which, which wasn't about UFOs, but the students got to talking about it, and they they wanted to see what I thought. And, and I had to tell them that, that I'll believe in UFOs if I see one on display in the Smithsonian. Right. Exactly. <laughs> there isn't really any hard evidence. And, and as a physicist, you, you have to say, well, you, you can't believe in a theory until you can do an experiment several times and, and have other people repeat it right. and, and actually produce results. And, and there are a number of stories in physics which are well known when a particular theory was widely accepted and pushed very hard by some people and finally experiments were done and it turned out that the theory could not be true. So I need some hard evidence. Yeah, exactly. I think we'll find the hard evidence somewhere buried in Area 51. <laughs> in the S4 region of Area 51. Do you believe that the, the, the government is, has secreted away the hard evidence? Well, I mean, we've had people who have come forward and said so. But, That's they, of course, they, they, need, they never bring any proof. Huh? They never bring any proof with them. Right. They just say that, that they That's not hard some. evidence. That here, that's yeah. hearsay. Um, hard evidence would be like there was actually a crash out here on the lawn of KU. <laughs> and we went over and picked it up. Of course, they would probably say it was a weather balloon. <laughs> or it was just a gold post. <laughs> go, go. Yes. There was a professor of geology named Ed Zeller. And he even had a nominal appointment in the physics department. And he gave a talk at one time. He'd been on, on one of these commissions. And, well, the results were inconclusive. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there were there were some. I think uh, at one point in time there were several. Um, I think the University of Colorado was asked to look into it, and like you said, there were these commissions that were that were uh, put put together. The Air Force wanted to get out of the business. They they wanted to you know call the rest of it. I think the CIA by that time the CIA and the NSA were probably taking over anyway. So. Yes. You put me in mind of an experience I had in the high Rockies in Colorado. Our two families cooperated in building a mountain cabin at 10,000 feet. And of course, we weren't there much, but as we would come back summer after summer, they would tell such stories of unidentified flying objects, but not close at hand, but up in the heavens. 
and the girls and our sons were quite impressionable at the time. <laughs> and around the campfire, they asked old dad what he thought. And I got into a storytelling, and I said that I really believed if there were such people or objects, that they would be friendly rather than hostile. And I've been proud of myself all these years for saying it just that way. Because it calmed them down. It probably calmed me down. And we live on fear in this country. We are the most fearful people on this planet, in my opinion. I know who's propagated this, and I know who continues to propagate it. And it happens that the man that's doing it now has the in initial T. <laughs> and if you want to read something that'll blow your mind open, read Time Magazine's latest editorialist writing, Joel Stein, five pages about the websites in this country that are spewing hatred at everybody and everything. Yeah. And Trump has permission now because he knows these are out there because one of them is his new campaign organizer, whatever you call it. He's the head man of one of these. I mean, we don't need this crap. We really don't. I'm mad as hell about it. I didn't, I'm, where have I been living? I haven't heard about these websites. There's apparently 11, 12 of them that are just spewing it out all day, every day, at everybody. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, it's like giving a microphone to uh, everybody. Anyway, um, I really don't have a whole lot more. Um, I really appreciate your questions. Uh, I brought some books over here to sell if anybody wants to buy one. Um, I'm now currently working on another book. Uh, one about Missouri sightings, and uh, so that's what I've been spending my summer doing. Uh, Thank you, David. It's, it's also very interesting. How, how much is it? How much is this? Um, special one today, eight dollars. <laughs> you can also get them on uh, Amazon.com. Oh, yeah, I would.